Bright and vibrant are the hues in which American popular music generally paints its cityscapes. And understandably so, as anyone inhabiting, visiting, or just passing through any of our major cities can see why they are often characterized as bastions of ambition, beacons of progress, and bustling hives of human activity. Country songs frequently exude a fondness for small-town homespun hospitality, but roots tend to run deep in the concrete jungle as well, with many city-themed songs blurring the line between person and place, between the streets and the synapses. Even as someone who's never quite caught the allure of urban living, I'm willing to bet that New York isn't the only city in the world that is both a place and a state of mind. Yet only the highest and loftiest ivory tower could adequately distance you from the reality that every bastion and beacon has its back alley, as it's beneath the industrious flicker of streetlights that we can observe the haves and have-nots in starkest contrast. With all of its players huddled in such close proximity, the city becomes the state stage on which to dramatize the inequality endemic to society as a whole. Nevertheless, urban poverty seems integral to the aesthetic identity of many, if not most, rap artists. If you didn't suckle at the teat of Mama Hard Knocks, you better at least pretend you did. And regardless of whether his roots are planted in seedy streets or dusty old country roads, poverty can buy the artist, especially the American artist, and especially, especially the American rap artist, quite a bit of social and aesthetic currency. This is no doubt connected to the deeper rags to riches pull your Yourself up by your bootstraps meta narrative so frequently tapped in American fiction. Within this deeply ingrained and to some sacred storytelling framework, the rampant inequality, corruption, and vice of the city act as a sort of character building crucible. Add one plucky, starry eyed street urchin, throw in a bit of elbow grease, a touch of talent, a pinch of legwork, and voila, you got yourself a rock star who before long will be wishing she was a plucky street urchin again. Few would deny that city life can be a dirty, dehumanizing game. But as representations in popular culture go, it's a game we are willing to play. So while there exists a veritable Marxist jukebox of songs in thematic struggle with the urban condition, and politician after politician assuring us that they know exactly what to do about it, the answer to civilization's merciless grind is never let us retire to the hills and live out our days as goat herds. Yet it is precisely this better-to-be-a-goat-herd mentality that prevails in our oldest literature. Like it or not, the ancient Hebrews had a profound impact on the moral fact fabric of Western civilization, but their suspicion of cities and city dwellers will seem foreign and maybe even barbaric to most readers of the Old Testament. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, the city is not simply a place where the acid rain falls on the just and unjust alike, but a den of debauchery whose denizens collectively shoulder the spiritual and moral onus of their sins. It's probably no accident that the first city is founded by the first murderer and that one of the most memorable instances of divine wrath in all three major monotheistic traditions is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities in which the great biblical patriarch Abraham failed to find even ten righteous men. And indeed, what we find there is a city full of men, both young and old, the Bible tells us, just spoiling to gang rape a couple of angelic tourists. Recall also how the prophet Jonah is force-fed to a mythical ancestor of Moby Dick when he flees from his divine mission to call the city of Nineveh to repentance. After he's vomited onto dry land and realizes that the Ninevites are surprisingly responsive to threats of fiery apocalypse, Jonah, having prepared for himself a nice picnic lunch in sadistic anticipation, of Old Testament God's storied pyrotechnics is disappointed to see the great Neo-Assyrian capital spared. It would be hard to find a modern Western text, popular or literary, in which a city laid to waste is represented as anything other than a devastating and depressing prospect. In fact, we can comfortably claim that our modern-day heroes are in many ways the opposite of biblical heroes like Noah, Abraham, or Jonah. The destruction of a city by some godlike but malevolent force is something our heroes are supposed to work desperately to prevent. Biblical heroes, on the other hand, and not just those directly tied to a nearby ancient city, often acquiesce to or actively seek to carry out the demands of a god that to our modern sensibilities appears utterly villainous. After the horrors of the 20th century, most sensible people acknowledge that a mandatory trip to the battery acid jacuzzi is probably not 
not the most effective treatment for civilization's warts. It's unproductive for our purposes to launch into some sanctimonious tirade about the savagery of a bygone culture. Most ancient Hebrew customs that haven't completely died off have morphed into something much more palatable to all but the fiercest opponents of organized religion. But the cultural and temporal distance between this and this does mean that any modern-day text with roots planted in Old Testament discourse will present certain interpretational hurdles to the uninitiated. So I firmly believe that any reading that disregards or downplays the Old Testament features of Simon and Garfunkel's classic The Sound of Silence is doing a serious intellectual disservice to the text. Silence has a richness and strangeness about it that make it a prime candidate for a close reading. It's the kind of text to which the measured strokes of the archaeologist's brush are better suited than the premeditated sweep of the scholar's lens. Still, I would argue that we do greatest justice to the text if we start by conceiving of its speaker as the recipient of the sort of revelation we find in the Bible and its underlying message as a kind of call to repentance. Old Testament discourse will be laid beside the text rather than on top of it more a point of comparison than a lens. The framework will serve our understanding of the text rather than the other way around. Reading the text as prophetic pastiche helps us to better grasp a style and tone that departs wildly from just about anything else you are likely to hear of enduring popularity from that period. And because the cityscape we find in silence is revealed gradually, situating the song's comparatively bizarre representation of city life within an older and more esoteric tradition will keep us from loitering aimlessly within the song's sleepy prelude. Hello darkness, my old friend I've come to talk with you again because a vision softly creeping Left its seeds while I was sleeping And the vision that was planted in my brain Still remains within the sound of silence we are well into the song before we realize that the speaker has more on his mind than gazing into the abyss of his own navel. Given the lullaby-like quality of the music and an opening line like Hello darkness my old friend It's no surprise how frequently this song provides the soundtrack to meme-worthy scenes of gushy and narcissistic sentimentality. And considering how the song is often used in popular culture, I half expect it to say Hello darkness my old friend a girl rejected me again Because incontinence left me seeping And now I sit here gently weeping we would be jumping the interpretive gun if we were to assume that the speaker befriended the darkness because, say, his irritable bowels have left him without a friend in the world. But to be fair, referring to darkness as an old friend does encourage us to try on the old irony goggles. Darkness is usually thought of as a negative quality, so calling it a friend can be taken as a subtle way of suggesting that the speaker has stared so long into the proverbial abyss that he's acquired a nihilistic fondness for it. But nothing in the surrounding language compels us to read this as the kind of darkness that accompanies bouts of drunken suicidal loneliness, as darkness can also be associated with tranquility and quiet reflection. It's certainly possible for the first two lines to conjure up an image of the speaker as some hunchback monstrosity chained and cowering in the darkest corner of his mother's basement, but the rest of the verse make a man in a dark room talking to himself about an apparently disturbing vision a more accurate characterization. At least I would be disturbed if something whose movements can be accurately described with the words softly creeping left its seeds in me during one of my REM cycles. Anyway, this slightly rapey, probably roofy slipping vision mentally impregnates our speaker and leaves him with a love child in the form of another 
baby-sized vision? I don't know. He's describing this thing like it's some kind of alien plant creature that reproduces by leaving its spores inside of a human host. So the vision was planted, it still remains, and it's fair to assume that the rest of the song will tell the story of how the vision seed develops into an angsty daffodil with daddy issues. Like all the verses, the first leaves us pondering a paradox. How can silence have a sound when silence is by definition soundless? The song will provide more and more ways to solve this riddle as it unfolds, but for now, it helps to hear it as a full sentence. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. So, extending the vision as seed metaphor, we can think of the silence as a kind of soil in which the vision seed might flourish. In other words, the speaker, in his one-sided dialogue with the darkness and silence, which, let's be reminded, is just a fancy and roundabout way of saying he's talking to himself self, is developing and expanding an inchoate thought via internal monologue. So despite how the sad Affleck meme might over-influence our reading, the tone here is both melancholic and meditative, pensive if you will. The sound of silence then can be understood, for now at least, as the kind of clarity that can only be heard during and after a little quiet time. So silence is, so far, a good thing, and the darkness is unironically the speaker's friend because it facilitates the kind of quiet reflection to which he is prone. Speaking holistically, the first verse is a kind of scene-setting prologue. We have a thinking man in a dark room about to recount no mere dream, but a vision. The word vision instantly lends the narrative prophetic significance and puts us on the lookout for how this prophetic project will develop. But the first verse mostly just grounds within the space-time continuum what we are going to need to understand as surreal and allegorical from here on out. The song can be described then as a dream sequence, a frame narrative, and because we are overhearing the speaker addressing a listener that is in no position to respond, a kind of apostrophe. This is not a trip through space and time, but through the the phantasmagoric funhouse of the dreamscape. So as we move into verse 2, we can expect the story to take some bizarre turns. In restless dreams I walked alone Narrow streets of cobblestone Neath the halo of a street lamp I turned my color to the cold and damp my eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light That split the night and touched the sound of silence our first stop in this world of restless dreams is a colonial-era city of cobblestone. The words narrow, cold, and damp set a decidedly dreary scene, but the flash of a neon light seems to herald the arrival of something truly menacing. Like some inbred axe murderer, this neon light stabs the speaker's eyes and splits the night. That light is good and darkness is evil is one of the most basic and cross-cultural conceptual metaphors, and light scattering the night before for it is, under this default schema, a symbol of good triumphing over evil. But a light that stabs the eyes and splits darkness that was earlier described as an old friend prompts us to consider how the text might be purposefully inverting the old light is good, dark is bad dichotomy. In any case, it further buttresses our claim that the speaker's friendship with the darkness should be taken unironically. The light of the street lamp, on the other hand, is described positively with the word halo. So we seem to have before us something more nuanced than a simple symbolic switcheroo. The text does indeed assign thematically atypical characteristics to light, both here and elsewhere, but for now, we gain the greatest interpretive traction by focusing on the juxtaposition of street lamp and neon light. But what does such a juxtaposition tell us? While street lamps and cobblestones must have seemed like the height of modernity to those who walked among them, but next to our modern megatropolises now and in 1965, the imagery is more quaint little town than sprawling urban center. Neon light, on the other hand, comes loaded with associations of fast-paced city living at its seediest and most nocturnal. 
While the living and working conditions of the Industrial Revolution might cast doubt on whether cobblestones and street lamps deserve to be considered idyllic, the symbolism of halo is unmistakable. Putting it all together, we have a haloed street lamp with its associations of purity and goodness being violently displaced by what we can assume is a neon sign. And a neon sign doesn't exactly need to be shown snorting coke off of a prostitute before we can fairly associate it with decadent and hedonistic nightlife. So, in summary, we have a decidedly gloomy but somehow pure and good vision of modernity being deposed by a garish and invasive version of itself, recalling that darkness and silence is so far a good thing for our contemplative narrator. We can assume that the touch of a neon light that stabs and splits isn't going to be gentle. But perhaps our speaker is just being needlessly dramatic, as a bright light, while initially unpleasant, can only be judged by what it reveals. So with eyes adjusted, let's take a hard look at verse 3. And in the naked light I saw Ten thousand people, maybe more People talking with eyes The sound of silence. The naked neon illuminates what we might picture as a populated city square and engages our paradox resolving reflexes by prompting us to consider how one might talk without speaking or hear without listening we immediately realize that making sense of these lines is less about resolving a paradox and more about describing the boundaries between thesaurus neighbors, about naming the color's various shades, so to speak. So what's the subtle distinction between talking and speaking, between hearing and listening? Well, on a spectrum of intensity from mindless prattle to dire proclamation, talking and speaking clearly occupy different positions. Think about talking trash versus speaking truth. It sounds a little awkward to say talking truth and speaking trash, right? That's partly because we intuitively understand that seriousness and meaningfulness are already encoded into the word speak, and that this isn't necessarily the case with talk. We can talk trash, talk tripe, and talk nonsense, but attaching the word speak to any of these nouns results in a phrase that sounds just a little off. And on a spectrum from locked in to present and body absent in mind, hearing and listening are oriented similarly to talking and speaking. Listening is simply a more focused and serious kind of hearing. Like so much English language poetry, the stylistic roots of these two lines are planted firmly in biblical prose. Whether consciously or not, these words echo the prophet Isaiah. But these two lines would also strike anyone familiar with the beginning of T.S. Eliot's excellent poem, The Hollow Men, with a sense of deja vu. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass or rats' feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Eliot, or rather his speaker, describes a world of shadow without substance, a civilization going through the motions. And I think Simon's speaker is on to something similar. 10,000 people talking without speaking and hearing without listening means a whole lot of words without any meaning a whole lot of noise that might as well be silence. But one man's rat race is another's corporate climb, and if meaning isn't to be found within the whirlwind of civilization's collective hustle, then where do we find it? That the speaker finds a multitude of hollow men beneath that neon light is obvious, but hollow in what way? People writing songs that voices never share provides us with a partial answer. 
When possible, it's helpful to convert abstract statements like this into concrete images, and given the context, these words are likely to conjure up pictures of the city's ignored and unwanted street performers. Because this line is part of the speaker's larger diagnosis of civilization's ills, we can assume that if the multitude were to suddenly join their voices in a spirited rendition of Whoa, whoa! to the music, then he would be left with little to critique. But obviously a citywide musical, painstakingly choreographed by the Street Performance Guild, isn't a fair expectation, so we should probably read a little deeper into the symbolism. And as tempting as it is to fill the pages of my Pink Pony Rainbow Diary, elaborating on what music means to me, it's probably best to situate our musings within the immediate context, and it's there we see the words speaking, listening, songs, and share betraying a worldview in stark opposition to the collective tunnel vision of the 10,000. So clearly, our speaker privileges the harmony of community and fellowship over the brute utility of 10,000 people going in 10,000 different directions. At last, we've uncovered the nature of the speaker's ideological project, and can clearly see see, to put it in eschatological terms, the world he wants to see wiped away, as well as the world he wants to see spring up in its place. The sound of silence no longer refers to a literal silence to be embraced, but an interpersonal silence to be disrupted. And with no one daring to disturb that silence, our prophetic speaker is poised to drop some heavenly wisdom on this shuffling mass of men. Who said I you do not know? Silence like a cancer grows Hear my words that I might teach you Say my arms that I might reach you But my words Like silent raindrops fell And echoed in the west of silence and the people bowed and prayed to the neon god they made and the sign flashed out its warning and the word that it was forming and the sign said the words of the prophet saw The story of Jonah grows increasingly useful as a frame of reference as we approach the end of the song, as what remains leaves little doubt that the speaker sees himself as a sort of prophet tasked with jarring the multitude out of existential and spiritual silence. The first part of verse 4, with its exhortations to hear my words that I might teach you and take my arms that I might reach you, is that point in the story where the prophet summons the courage to preach the people back from the edge of doom. Silence, which was before some vaguely defined malaise, is now likened to a spreading cancer, which infuses the speaker's ideological project with a new sense of urgency. For Jonah, the cancer is sin. For our speaker, the cancer is the silence of human disconnection. But instead of convincing the people to slip into their sackcloth pajamas and settle in for a conciliatory fast, the speaker's words fall like silent raindrops and resound with all the oratorial gusto of echoes in a well. As if despite the speaker, the people bowed and prayed to the neon god they made, with the suggestion of idolatry being unmistakable. There's a lot we can say about this, but let's hold off for now and focus instead on forming a complete picture of the literal. A literal which has us working through some rather bizarre dream logic. Why, for instance, is the neon idol flashing out a warning and pointing the people to the words of the prophets? Warnings and prophecies, it seems to me, should issue from any source but an idol. And how does the words of the prophets are written on subway walls and tenement halls even count as a warning? Sounds more like a proclamation. Close examination leaves one with the distinct impression that Simon has surrendered a bit of control over his lyrics here, and that some of these words have been selected for sound rather than meaning. 
That's a fair impression, but we also have to remember that a dream sequence doesn't have the same sort of obligation to our sense-making mechanisms as a story set within the quote-unquote real world, and that a certain amount of messiness is to be expected. We must remind ourselves that this is all happening inside the speaker's head. Even so, the song's final scene slots satisfactorily into our speaker as prophet framework, because a prophet, by definition, perceives truths to which others are blind. The idol to which others mindlessly bow and pray is, to the prophet, a warning that the one true God is about to commence the most apocalyptic of elbow drops. To those who are neither decadent nor hedonistic, the sign that signifies decadence and hedonism can only point to something better, higher, and truer than itself. Our prophet never really had a chance of propelling the people out of silence, because where he sees a tawdry idol, they see a glowing god. Our prophet's words fail to admonish the foolish multitude because he doesn't share their perception of reality. Consider by way of comparison the almost hilarious compliance of the Ninevites once Jonah finally musters up the courage to confront them. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. The Ninevites don't even have to ask why their destruction is imminent, because people and prophet already seem to be playing by the same rules laid down by the same wrathful God. In the book of Jonah, the prophet is little more than a divinely appointed referee. This is far from the case with our prophet, as he seems to be reaching out to a people playing a very different ideological game. The last piece of the speaker's ideological project falls into place with the words of the prophets are written on subway walls and tenement halls. Having gone unheeded, our prophet defers his message to other purveyors of truth. But why is it to be found on subway walls and tenement halls of all places? Let's unpack this a bit. The words of the prophets, something meaningful, something real, something true, is to be found within the domain of the disenfranchised and the downtrodden. Not in society's center, but at its fringes. By implication, the people who need to be told this are not likely to frequent tenement halls or stare contemplatively at subway walls. And people who need to be told that the words of the prophets are whispered in the sound of silence are probably, in one sense or another, leading lives polluted by noise. So our refrain returns to where it started, as shorthand for the heightened clarity that accompanies quiet reflection. And it's with this proclamation that the text reaches both its climax and its conclusion. Zooming back out, there are a number of ways we might reach a more holistic understanding of this peculiarly prophetic ideological project. But we need to first recall that what we are overhearing is a dream sequence nested within a conversation with darkness. With all the surreal imagery, it's easy to forget that the speaker is just some dude talking to himself in a dark room. That all of the really interesting stuff in this song is happening inside someone's head. And to the extent that theoretical approaches can be understood as a set of nifty decoder rings for critical readers, the psychoanalytical approach would seem, in this case, the one ring to rule them all. The likes of Freud and Jung would doubtlessly have a field day with this introverted nyctophiliac with delusions of prophetic grandeur and a strange aversion to neon. But a psychoanalytical reading would still need to take into account all the thematic and stylistic parallels to biblical prophecy. Right at the start, the speaker refers to his dream as a vision. Visions don't bubble up from the deepest recesses of the unconscious like so many bullet-strewn power fantasies or naughty little wet dreams. Visions, by definition, are handed down by the great cosmic consciousness. When he is confronted with the would-be converted, the speaker's description of the silent 10,000 is ripped straight from Isaiah. Furthermore, his urge to reach and teach would imply that the people need to, in some way, be ministered to, and that he actually has a message to bring them. And no sooner than they fail to heed that message are the people characterized as idolaters. Even the number 10,000 can't escape being swept up in the speaker's prophetic fervor. 
However, this prophet's mission deflates like a flatulating balloon as his words fall like silent raindrops and echo in the wells of silence. But as his final proclamation reaches our ears, he looks less and less like Jonah and more and more like Jesus. Not that he didn't before. The whole sound of silence riddle falls right in line with such New Testament paradoxes as the first shall be last, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and he who loses his life will find it. But a passage from Matthew 13 is especially helpful as we speculate on what we are to make of this text. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. After quoting the aforementioned passage from Isaiah 6, Jesus continues, But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This distinction between those who see and hear and those blind and deaf to the truth is as useful to our understanding of silence as it was meant to be to Jesus' disciples. The psychoanalytical reading that would coldly and clinically dismiss the speaker's vision as a delusion of grandeur or a manifestation of social anxiety is a case that might be made. But as a comprehensive understanding of the whole text, it leaves much to be desired. As I've said repeatedly in other videos, fictional texts always operate on two dimensions. A message from a fictional speaker to a fictional listener, and a message from a real-world author to a real-world audience. The purely psychoanalytical angle would account well enough for the former, but would leave us out here in the real world with an overwhelming sense of, so what? The speaker isn't just sharing secrets with the darkness enveloping his physical space or the people populating his psychological streets. Even within the fiction of the text, this would be madness and absurdity since neither darkness nor dreams can be spurred to action. He isn't calling the silent 10,000 to discipleship. He's calling us. We, in other words, are the ones blessed with eyes to see and ears to hear. But see and hear what exactly? Surely expecting religious platitude to radiate from those subway walls and tenement halls is taking too literally the text's prophetic quality and ignoring its distinctly social character. Like Cohen's Hallelujah and Hosier's Take Me to Church, silence puts the biblical to work for the secular, borrowing the cultural and linguistic capital of spirituality to infuse with otherworldly significance an otherwise worldly message. Our prophet takes religious conviction's upward momentum and redirects it outward. The seemingly anti-social flavor of Hello Darkness, My Old Friend turns out to be anything but. Loving your neighbor, so to speak, is to our speaker the greatest of commands. Clearly, the speaker cautions against charting a course for our lives through the white noise of interpersonal minimalism. But the actual content of his message follows the trajectory of a bouncy ball. This is a frustration any fan of Zelda-style adventure games should be able to appreciate. All you want is for the hunchback monstrosity chained and cowering in the darkest corner of his mother's basement to forge you the legendary weapon. Only he has chronic arthritis, and the healing cream he needs can only be acquired from an apothecary whose cottage is on the other end of a demon-infested wasteland. So after you arrive soaked in demon blood and scorched with hellfire, he informs you that he is a forgetful old man and no longer remembers how to make that particular cream, but that he tattooed the secret recipe on a sleeping orphan's bum so many years ago. At which point, you say, wait a minute, I am an orphan whose childhood predisposition for outdoor naps makes it highly likely that a creepy apothecary used my baby smooth buttocks as makeshift parchment. So you and your sprightly companion with recipe glistening beneath your butt sweat fast travel back to the hunchback monstrosity only to discover that your level is so high from killing all those demons that the legendary weapon now has roughly the utility of a toothpick. What were we talking about again? Oh yeah, the song. From the moment we hear the word vision, we wait patiently for the morsel of wisdom promised by that word to collide with our philosophical taste buds. We follow the bouncy ball into the dreamscape, down the cobblestone streets, beneath the glare of the neon light, push our way through the crowd, and stretch our arms and ears toward the prophet, only to hear him whinge cryptically about silent raindrops and well echoes. We come all this way just for some sketchy neon sign to tell us that those actually touched by sacred truth have recorded their heavenly wisdom on a surface of 
about a sacrosanct as a bathroom stall. And it's then we realize that we actually have to get off our bums and go break bread with graffiti artists and tenement dwellers. So what we are left with at song's end is not so much a pearl of wisdom, but a gospel-esque call to action, with the assurance that something self-evidently and transcendently true waits for us among society's untouchables. But the song's final variation on its refrain leaves us pondering an even deeper meaning. We follow the speaker into his unconscious in the hope of unraveling a mystery and are met, ultimately, with more mysteries. We expect the truth to squeal and scintillate like a guitar solo blaring from the back of a skyward unicorn and are instead told in the song's final nod to the biblical prophets that truth is whispered in the sound of silence. But what is whispered? A signpost points to a signpost points to a signpost on and on and on until the song is forced to point to something beyond itself to something beyond the words out of which it is composed. And even then, all we are promised is more words. And so the speaker's quasi-Marxist finale chokes on its own Derridian implications. Words which seem to put us on a collision course with meaning lock us in a never-ending game of linguistic bumper cars. Words bounce off of words, which bounce off of more words, and it's all great fun, but we never really go anywhere. We expect a monolithic panorama of meaning and are met only with traces and fragments. The linguistic vehicle has taken us as far as it will, and we are left to go the rest of the way on foot, as it were. And so the song ends the only way it can, by lulling us back into wordless contemplation. It fails to fully satisfy, but strangely enough, this lack of satisfaction with the prophet's words makes the sound of silence all the more inviting. That is all I have to say, but certainly not all that can be said. What have I oversimplified, overcomplicated, or left out altogether? And be sure to join me next time as we take a look at Bob Dylan's The Times They Are A-Changin', a song that similarly appropriates the prophetic voice, but to a very different end. Let me know all I've missed in the comments below, and please be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more in-depth song analysis. This is Professor Chase. Hope to see you next lesson. When the lights go down in the city and the sun shines